monster professor. <laughs> that's fun. That's funny to me. I think I'm going to keep that intro. Welcome to the Monster Professor. This is a show in which we discuss and explore monsters in literature, in myth, film, games, folklore, culture, and beyond. We're going to dig deep and we're going to get serious, so be prepared for that. I'm your host, Josh Woods. I'm an author, editor, an actual professor, but now also some kind of self-proclaimed monster expert. I guess you get to be the judge of that. Today we're talking about monsters and literature. Actually, I want to start an exploration of monsters from the very first pieces of literature we have all the way up through our day and age in a really quick chronological survey. I think that's a big task. It's going to take at least three of these episodes to do it quickly. We're going to skip over plenty of monsters that are deserving of their own podcasts in the future, but I'm going to try to hit on the most significant ones. When I'm talking about monsters in literature, I don't mean metaphorical monsters as in villains. I think villains are worthy of their own discussions without talking without having to call them monsters necessarily. I want to talk about real actual monsters and the fact is literature is full of them and it has always been. As we go on this exploration I want to try to find the answers to three main questions. First, who are some of the most significant monsters? I want to introduce you to them. I want you to get a good sense of what they're like. Two, what do they mean? I think that monsters have meant different things through time. In fact, I think more specifically there have been about four stages of what monsters mean in literature. I want to take us through each of those four stages and clarify what they mean in each and every one of those. And third, why do monsters matter? They must be important for some reason if we keep putting them in our stories from the beginning of time, age after age, all the way up until today. They must mean something, right? I run across a lot of people who sometimes don't take monsters quite seriously. They don't think that any piece of literature involving actual monsters is meant to be taken seriously just for entertainment. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think they do matter, and I think once a monster, a real one, is involved in a story, the story changes on a significant level. We're going to dig into that too. So let's get started at the very beginning. The Epic of Gilgamesh, the oldest story we have on record. That comes to us from about 1800 BC. We found earlier scraps roughly 2100 BC, so we're talking about a story 4,000 years old. From what we know archaeologically, It predates the very first pieces of the Bible by about a thousand years. The Epic of Gilgamesh is about a hero named Gilgamesh and his sidekick Enkidu. Uh, They're a really cool duo. They're kind of like Han Solo and Chewbacca. In fact, monstrous sidekicks are worthy of their own podcast in the future. But for now, it's enough to say the Epic of Gilgamesh is essentially about a hero and his buddy going out and fighting monsters. At least that's the story for a large part of it. The biggest, baddest, scariest monster that they come across is one called Humbaba. I think we have to mention how cool the names are in the Epic of Gilgamesh, by the way. Gilgamesh, Enkidu, and Humbaba. That's just cool. So Humbaba is this guardian of the cedar forest, and he is this big, scary, bad type of thing, and it's not quite clear what he is. He's been rendered as some type of gigantic human in some ancient Mesopotamian art. Uh, More recent pieces of art have shown him to be some type of rhinoceros-like creature with scales and a big scorpion-like tail. It's not quite it's not quite clear all we do know is that he's terrible and terrifying and the epic of gilgamesh says when he roars it is like the torrent of the storm his breath is like fire and his jaws are death itself 
the watchman of the forest never sleeps. Humbaba is so scary, in fact, that Enkidu is saying, don't do it, Gilgamesh, bad idea, don't go fight this guy, you're gonna die. For Gilgamesh, though, Humbaba represents a great challenge. Gilgamesh roughly explains his side of it as, look, if this Humbaba really is as big and as bad as everybody says, then there is a real chance I'm going to fight him and lose and die. And if I die against such a big challenge and such an amazing creature as Humbaba, then my death is in great glory. That's good for me. If I happen to win, I just beat the biggest, baddest thing in existence. So that's nothing but reward. It's a win-win for me. And so he goes and fights him. Enkidu finally comes along with him. And they end up figuring out Humbaba's weakness. Since he's guardian of the cedar forest, what they have to do is cut down cedar trees. That deforestation zaps his strength and allows them to execute him. The story of Epic of Gilgamesh gets much deeper and more complex after the monster fighting episode, but it doesn't necessarily get out of the realm of essentially a monster fighting story. That's the very first piece of literature that not just Western culture has, that as far as we know, all humanity has in written form. And it's a monster story. Time out for a tangent. Let me do a quick personal story tangent on this one. I have a strange relationship with the Epic of Gilgamesh. Not too many years ago, my father was dying of cancer. He was in a type of coma on his deathbed. I was going to go sit up with him. We were, as a family, taking turns, making sure somebody's with him 24 hours a day during his final hours and his final days. And so I thought, well, I'll bring something to read. What could give me more perspective in this moment than perhaps the very first thing that humans have ever written? And so I brought along the Epic of Gilgamesh, and I remembered the death of Enkidu in the story being quite sad, but I had the incorrect memory of Enkidu dying in battle with Humbaba, so I was thinking of it as a kind of heroic death. When I started reading it again, I realized, oh no, that's not what actually happens at all. Enkidu gets essentially cancer and dies a slow bed death and it's really sad and upsetting and Gilgamesh has a hard time dealing with this in fact such a hard time that he's determined to figure out the secrets of life and death and mortality I was not prepared for that kind of mirroring of their situation and our situation it was strange and it was sad for me uh, but I do have to admit that it did give me a little bit of perspective on my situation Tangent done. Let's move ahead to our next one. Let's go with the Greeks. The Greeks have so many monster tales, it's really tough to pick one or two. I'm making myself have to pick one or two now. We're going to do future episodes on just monsters in Greek mythology. But if I had to pick two, I want to go with, and I am making myself only pick two, I'm going to go with two that I consider to be most iconic. Let's start with the Minotaur. The Minotaur, I think most people have a pretty accurate image of what the Minotaur is. Most people think of a big huge guy with a bull's head. That seems to be, according to art, how the Greeks imagined him. A later writer, uh, Ovid, in the Latin, calls him a human bull, half man, half beast. And then much later, artists rendered that as a kind of centaur-like creature. But it sure looks like the original one was the what we consider now to be the general, generally accepted image. Big dude, bull ahead. And this... This monster eats human flesh. In fact, it appears that all he eats is human flesh, and he prefers young people over old people. I think that's kind of ageist. I don't know what's wrong with seasoned meat, but that's his preference. And so they grab Athenian youths and maidens 
and toss them to the Minotaur. The Minotaur is such a big, bad, scary monster, in fact, that they have to build some type of prison for him, and so the Greek inventor Daedalus comes up with an inescapable maze called the Labyrinth, and the Minotaur is trapped in the middle of this thing, and they throw his human food into the labyrinth. The, those humans go around wandering aimlessly through the labyrinth, no way to escape until they finally encounter the Minotaur and get eaten. The Minotaur is eventually slain by a Greek hero named Theseus, who makes a career of killing monsters. He killed more monsters before he got to the famous Minotaur slaying. So here are a couple of fascinating points about the Minotaur story. First, for a long time, the labyrinth has been seen as a type of symbol of the depths of the human mind. Once you go deep into your mind, it's a lot like getting into a type of inescapable maze. Uh, the, there's some sense that the Greeks thought that. Many, many later scholars and writers have thought something like this. And if that's the case, then in the middle of the depths of the human mind, there lurks some type of beast. That's the Minotaur. Some type of beast in you that is part human, but part animal. A second fascinating feature of this Minotaur story is the fact that he eats human flesh. He's part man, part beast, but the part beast he is, is a bull. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the dietary habits of cattle, but I don't see many ranchers feeding their bulls human flesh or any type of flesh whatsoever, right? Bulls are herbivores. So, of this half man, half bull, which is the side that is the evil one who craves human flesh? Time out for a question from the audience. When I was giving a lecture at a live event recently, one of the audience members asks, wait a minute, if the labyrinth was inescapable, then after Theseus slayed the Minotaur, how did he escape? That's a good question. Actually, before Theseus went in, he was given a ball of yarn by a maiden named Ariadne. She actually happened to be the Minotaur's half-sister. And Theseus unwound the thread as he made his way deeper and deeper into the labyrinth. Now, this ball of yarn or ball of thread was actually called a clue. And those of you who are familiar with weaving might already be familiar with that term. It's a clue. So he strung it out as he went, and then after he slayed the Minotaur, he followed that thread all the way back. Or in other words, he followed the clue all the way back. And that's where we get our word today for clues, as in little pieces of information that we use to solve a mystery. If we need a little bit more evidence that the labyrinth itself is a, is a, um, as a type of or a symbol of the depths of the human mind, then using a clue to find your way out of it is one more little piece. Pretty cool. Good question. Thank you for that. Now back to it. All right, so the second Greek monster I want to get to is a cyclops named Polyphemus. He shows up in the Odyssey. That's the second epic by Homer. The first is the Iliad covering the Trojan War. The second one is the Odyssey and that follows Odysseus on his way home from the Trojan War. Like a lot of hero tales, we have essentially somebody just trying to get home. Whether you're Marty McFly or Dorothy from Oz or Odysseus from the Odyssey, you're just trying to find your way home. So he gets sidetracked on an island with his crew and gets captured by this cyclops, Polyphemus. He's a crude, one-eyed giant. He's also a rancher and a dairy farmer for what it's worth. And big surprise, yet again, he likes to eat human flesh. So he traps 
Odysseus and his crew in his cave blocks their way and starts eating the crew one by one as he feels like it. Odysseus, being a bit of a trickster, comes up with a way to get Polyphemus drunk. And while Polyphemus is passed out, Odysseus jumps on top of his face with a big spear, stabs him right through the eye, and starts digging it around like stirring a big pot of stew. It's pretty vivid as Homer relays it. Um, Homer was a vicious dude. It's pretty cool. Read it. And... The blind Polyphemus can't end up getting any help from his other Cyclops buddies because of another trick Odysseus pulled on him, which is giving him the name Nobody or No Man so that Polyphemus is screaming for help and the the others are like, who's messing with you? And he's like, nobody's messing with me. Odysseus got him there. And so to finally escape, Odysseus puts on this coat of wool and poses as one of Polyphemus' livestock. Polyphemus can't tell because he's blind, of course, now, and so Odysseus gets to escape. I think one of the fascinating features of the, well, one of the many fascinating features of the Polyphemus story is how giants function. Giants are worthy of their own feature podcast, but ever so briefly, it has occurred to me that as opposed to other types of monsters, dragons for instance, giants tend to act a whole lot like an old tyranny, like an old state or an old government system, an old king who has grown too big and unwieldy and is nothing but tyrannical. He traps you in, he seems to feed off of you or feed off, feed off of the common people one by one, and there's no real way to escape him. But Odysseus gives us the formula for how to get, how to get out of or escape a type of tyranny. What do you do if you're trapped in a dystopia? What if you do if you're trapped in a tyranny? Well, you hide your identity by giving a different name. You take out the surveillance system. And then you disguise yourself as something innocuous and sneak across the border. That's what Odysseus did. By the way, if there are any government officials listening to this podcast right now, I in no way advocate any citizen doing anything similar to what Odysseus did. Our government is certainly in no way a tyranny. We're all behind you 100%. Everything is fine. Everything is fine. Now I want to jump ahead in time to our next monster. From the Odyssey, which was composed roughly 700 BC, to the Saga of the Volsungs. Now that is a compilation of stories, and our compilation comes to us from about the year 1200. That's 1200 AD, so we jumped quite a bit in time. But there's plenty of reason to believe that the fundamental stories in the Saga of the Bullsongs, particularly the dragon slaying story I want to focus on, comes to us uh, more at about the year 300, especially since it's even referenced in Beowulf, which comes long before 1200 AD. So in the Saga of the Volsungs, we have the famous story of Sigurd the Dragon Slayer. I want to talk about the dragon he slays, Fafnir. I have to put Fafnir up there as one of the most, if not the most, fascinating dragon in all of myth, literature, legend, what have you. His story is so weird because he's originally a dwarf. He transforms. So ever so briefly, his story goes something like this. He is the brother of a dwarf named Otter and a dwarf named Regan. They are all three sons of a dwarf named Hredmar. And the brother Otter gets killed happens to be by Loki, who's hanging out with Odin and Tyr. And so the gods have to pay off Hredmar 
for their having done him wrong by killing his son. They give him a big pile of gold, which happens to include some cursed items, such as the cursed one ring that they have to lay on top of the body of Otter to finish off the payment. And cursed it is because the first thing the dwarf Fafnir thinks when his father gets this pile of gold is, man, I'd love that gold for myself. All I have to do is kill my father and take it. So he kills his father and takes it, runs off to a cave, and just sits on top of that gold. And in his greedy type of self-indulgence, just sits on it and sits on it and doesn't give it away, doesn't share it, doesn't do anything. And year after year, he slowly turns into a dragon. There's something called the Helm of Terror that he put on that seems to have helped him transform into a dragon, but it doesn't seem to necessarily do that since Sigurd, the dragon slayer, eventually puts on the same thing. He doesn't turn into a dragon. So Fafnir is wingless, as some of the early dragons are, and instead of blowing fire, he blows poison out of his mouth as he crawls around on his belly. He's this terrifying thing. And he also has a regular habit of needing to go down to the creek below his cave and get a drink every day. So his brother, Regan, ends up becoming a blacksmith who is capable of making a sword that can pierce the otherwise impenetrable scales of his brother, Fafnir the Dragon. So Regan adopts a young orphaned hero, Sigurd, essentially trains him, gives him this sword, Gram. Gram's a cool sword, by the way, and talks Sigurd into going forth, slaying Falfnir, and taking the treasure for himself. Being a dwarf, he's kind of scheming. He hides the fact that, oh, by the way, Falfnir is, you know, my brother, and I actually just plan on stabbing you in the back as soon as you take him out and taking all the treasure for myself. The most fascinating part of the Fafnir story to me is the conversation that happens after Sigurd slays him. To slay him, Sigurd essentially digs a trench across the path where Fafnir goes to get his drink, hides in it, and then jumps up with the sword, slices his belly open, mortally wounds him. And after Fafnir thrashes there and lies on the ground, he calls Sigurd over to him. He's like, let's talk. And this conversation is awesome. It ends up becoming the formula for all good conversations with dragons. Um, one that might come to the top of the mind is Bilbo's conversation with Smaug and the Hobbit. And Fafnir has this strange combination of condescension but wisdom. The first thing he wants to know is, who is this guy who has mortally wounded me, and what's his social class? Did I get killed by a king or a peasant? Because the peasant thing would really upset me. And so he asks Sigurd his name. Sigurd tries to pull the Odysseus trick of hiding his name. Like, oh, I'm nobody. I have no father and mother. But Fafnir is smarter than a cyclops. He's not having it. He's like... Look, that's impossible. And although you say you have no father and no mother and you have no real name, you will know to your dying day that you're a liar. This really hits at Sigurd's pride and it totally works. And so Sigurd is like, okay, I'll tell you everything you need to know about me. And so the conversation continues and Fafnir in his combination of condescension and wisdom says okay yeah maybe you won the treasure is yours but it's cursed and it will bring you great suffering until it finally brings you a torturous death and on top of that i am smart enough to know that you're not listening to me right now and then he dies and sure enough, Sigurd hears him, but wasn't really listening, takes the treasure, and everything Fafnir predicts comes true. It's really cool. Dragons in and of themselves are worthy of a future podcast. We've got at least one whole dragons podcast planned, if not more, because the deep myth of dragons goes into really fascinating places. And there are many more than just Fafnir. But that's good for now. 
Let's hit one last monster tale before we end stage one of this ancient segment of monsters and literature. And that is the famous Beowulf. We can say with some confidence that Beowulf was composed in the year 700 AD. That's what Tolkien said, and so let's go with that no matter what more modern scholars say. Beowulf is essentially a monster hunting story, not unlike the others that we've seen before, Epic of Gilgamesh for instance, one that involves three stages of monster. The first, Grendel, the second, Grendel's mother, the third, a dragon. We don't know who wrote Beowulf, we don't have the name of the poet who composed it, but we can say that he's up there with the best writers of all time. He deserves a place with Shakespeare, with Homer, you name it. And this has become rather frustrating for some scholars, because if we have such a great literary talent here, why did he choose to tell an epic about killing three different monsters? Why not make it a political epic? Why not make it a historical epic? Or maybe even something closer to a more personal or um, relationship-based kind of epic. Instead, the Beowulf poet decided to make it a monster hunting story. I thought a lot about this. If he is so brilliant, and he is, and he puts these monsters in these forms in these three stages, there must be some type of meaning to it. The deeper I got into it, the more I realized just a description of what Beowulf faces in these three monsters and how he defeats them is kind of an important lesson on how to deal with problems in life and what kinds of problems come at you. So the first monster in Beowulf is Grendel. Grendel comes and attacks at your home out of nowhere, like an RKO. That's a pro wrestling reference, by the way. And he gets into the hall of Hrothgar and snatches up his heroes and his champions in the middle of the night while they're asleep after a good evening of partying. And he eats them. Once again, like a lot of monsters do at the first stage of monsters in literature, eats people. And there's no way to hurt him. Grendel doesn't use weapons. Weapons can't seem to hurt him. Until Beowulf comes along. So how does Beowulf defeat Grendel? He beats him on his own terms. Beowulf says, if Grendel uses no weapons, I'll use no weapons. If what Grendel does is come in and grab people, then I'll just grab Grendel. In fact, I will grab his grabber, his arm. Beowulf does and grabs it right off of his body. That's enough to defeat Grendel, send him running, and Grendel never poses a threat again. That's the first monster, and I think that tells us something about the types of problems that can that can hit you in life. Sometimes, out of nowhere, a problem comes and hits you in your own home. How do you defeat it? You defeat it on its own terms. The second monster, though, is Grendel's mother. Because it's important to realize, no matter what problem comes at you, even if you defeat it, that doesn't mean that you've defeated all possible monsters. There was a source of that problem, there was a source of that monster, Grendel, whoever gave birth to it, that's Grendel's mother. And although she might not pose as much of an immediate threat as Grendel did, she will produce more monsters and they'll come at you and produce more and they'll keep on coming at you and they'll just keep on coming until you destroy the source of all monsters. And so what Gren what Beowulf does is goes out. You can't wait for her at your home and wait for her to come to you and defeat her because she's not going to reliably come and, and attack you every night like Grendel did. You have to venture out from the safety of your home, relative safety of the hall, and go deep underwater, go deep into a cave, and find her where she lies, the source of monsters, and defeat her. He brings a, 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 he brings a heroic sword with him, not too much unlike Graham, it would seem, until he tries to use it on Grendel's mother, and it breaks, and that's the end of that sword. And now he's really in trouble. Grendel's mother has the best of him. He's on her turf. It's where she is most powerful. So how does Beowulf defeat her? 
Well, he realizes what he brings with him to defeat this source of problems, that breaks. What he has to do is use what is available there against the source of problems. In this case, that is a giant sword hanging on the wall. It's Grendel's mother's sword. He uses that against her and he's able to beat her. I think that's a description of a next stage of kinds of problems that you might encounter in life. But once you are able to be successful enough that you can put out fires, so to speak, and you can even defeat major sources of problems so that you no longer have to put out fires in life, you're sitting pretty, man. Life is good. And so now the lesson is sit back and enjoy your success. That's what Beowulf did. He becomes king, although he's not quite as good of a king as he was a warrior and a monster hunter. So it would seem that everything's good and fine, but there's always one last monster, even after you have essentially won in life. And that monster is the fact that no matter what, things fall apart things decay, you will get old, death is on its way. And this type of entropy and this type of ever-pressing chaos is essentially undefeatable. There's no way to overcome that. This is a problem that is not necessarily your fault. It doesn't even have to be your responsibility to, your responsibility to face heroically. This problem in the Epic of Beowulf is the dragon. And Beowulf doesn't stir this up. The dragon is not some problem or some monster that Beowulf goes out and seeks. Someone else in the kingdom stirs up this dragon. This dragon, by the way, is a fascinating one. And he has these weird idiosyncratic quirks and habits that he does too, a lot like Fafnir. No time to talk about that right now. That's a future dragons episode. So this dragon comes and attacks, and Beowulf has a couple of choices. He can send out his best heroes to fight it. They might stand a chance against it. If he goes out and fights it, he knows he stands no real chance. Even if he defeats it, he's not going to live through it. But that's the point of life. You're not going to live through it. So what Beowulf does, goes out, faces it, he does do some serious damage to it. Uh, a younger hero is with him who can take Beowulf's place as the real monster hunting hero once he's dead. But does Beowulf die? Spoiler alert, yes, he dies. Actually, there were a lot of spoiler alerts in this. I even, I even gave some really awful spoiler alerts in the Epic of Gilgamesh. I guess it's not too soon, though. You had about 4,000 years to read that one. So, in this case, in Beowulf, we have three stages of monsters, and seeing what Beowulf did in approaching each one of these types of problems, the three different types of problems you're going to encounter in life, that might very well be one of the most important takeaways from Beowulf. Or at least that's my opinion on the matter. I haven't found anybody who says that exactly, so take that for what it's worth. So I think we can call this the end of stage one. We've seen the ancient stage of literature, monsters in that ancient stage. So back to that question, what do monsters mean? In this stage, we've seen monsters as path to heroism. Stage one, monsters as path to heroism. In this stage, the monster is always this outside force and it comes in and attacks. It's passing truck. I should probably seriously cut out the passing truck sounds and any time I say passing truck, but for those of you who haven't quite realized it yet, although it's probably obvious, I'm entirely new at this podcasting thing. Some of you who are quite attuned to audio types of perfection are probably cringing through this whole thing. I'll get better. I think I will anyway. That's a rough promise. So back to this stage one. Monster is path to heroism. The monster is like an outside force. It's like chaos lurking at the edges of human firelight. And the only way to address it is to go out and meet it with courage and with strength to find ways to make yourself strong enough to defeat those monsters very often on their own terms. 
But that doesn't really address, well, why do they matter? Like if we're talking symbols, let's say, for instance, how I posited that the Beowulf monsters are symbols of types of problems that could come at you, or maybe I, I hesitate to say archetypes of problems that can come at you. Well, couldn't that have been represented with something else? Couldn't that have just been represented with something a little bit more realistic, like other people or natural problems? Well, that's a good question. I think we're going to run across several good answers to why do monsters matter. For this stage one, this ancient stage, let's give Tolkien the last word on why they matter. Tolkien says in his famous essay, Beowulf, the Monsters and the Critics, by the way, Tolkien is known primarily for being the writer of The Lord of the Rings, um, but that's not what he built his career on. He was an Oxford Don, high, highly regarded academic, and he was essentially a professor of Old English or Anglo-Saxon, and he was the world's premier scholar on Beowulf and similar literature. And what he wrote is, it is just because the foes in Beowulf are inhuman that the story is larger and more significant and by the way, this is me not talking at this point. He was comparing it to some other type of story in which instead of monsters, we have like a political epic or an historical epic. Okay, back to Tolkien. Larger and more significant than a great king's fall. It glimpses the cosmic and moves with the thought of all men concerning the fate of human life and efforts. It stands amid but above the petty wars of princes and surpasses the dates and limits of historical periods, however important. So according to Tolkien, once you throw monsters in there, you are getting at something bigger than just the historical, something bigger than just the personal. Now you're dealing with something that concerns all of humanity, maybe even maybe even something that concerns the cosmic. I think we did a pretty good job covering monsters and literature that we might call ancient or pagan and classifying that as stage one. We got all the way from Gilgamesh to Beowulf. I say let's call that good for today. Thank you so much for listening to The Monster Professor. I hope you enjoyed it. Next time, we're going to get into maybe stage two and three, all in one episode, and then our final stage of more modern monsters, all the way up to our day and age. So I hope you found it useful. Something else you might find useful if you're interested in seeing my take on monsters is a novel called The Black Palace. It's available on Amazon.com right now. You can just search it, search The Black Palace on Amazon.com. If you want to find out more about that, my novel on my take of monsters, primarily witches, by the way, in this novel, but a whole lot of other monsters as well. Or if you just want to find out a little bit more about me or what I'm up to, check out my website, joshwoodsauthor.com. I had to put the author in there because there are other Josh Woodses out there, motocross guy, uh, a really cool tattoo artist, even a pro wrestler, which I'm envious of. I'm just the writerly kind. And so check that out, joshwoodsauthor.com and or the Black Palace on amazon.com. And once again, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed The Monster Professor.